Cool. So yeah, so we'll just have a couple of minutes while we get uh, Marco's slides all set up and everything. Uh, and uh, hope everyone's having a good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you're at, uh, watching uh, uh, API Day's uh, interface conference. Um, Want to just take a quick moment to remind everybody during the breaks to go check out the sponsor booths. There's uh, a lot of good partners that are in there that uh, are waiting to talk to you so you can learn about the latest kinds of uh, innovations that they have there. Uh, and so uh, definitely check those out on the break. We have, a, I think, one coming up here in about uh, 90 minutes or so. Uh, so let's see, are we uh, getting close? Uh, right on, cool. So I think we're getting uh, pretty close on the slides coming up. Um, you know what we can do? Uh, we could actually take a look at some API days past. Uh, so, you know, back Back in the time when when we were all meeting in person, hopefully, I hope everyone's staying safe. We can get back there again in the future. Uh, we can all get back in the uh, in the same space and talk APIs uh, in person. So here's a couple of pictures from events that I've been uh, privileged to attend in, uh, over the years. Um, mostly drinking Australia uh, beer, it seems like, is kind of a common theme in in most API days. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, in the chat, if uh, anybody, uh, if anyone got a beer from me in a previous API days, I'd love to hear from you. Also, if you want to drop any information in as to where you're from, that'd be uh, awesome. I'm based here in Colorado. I've been in my bunker basement office uh, the entire pandemic, just being basically a hermit uh, over here. Uh, but uh, but yeah, very excited to get back out. We uh, we actually just had the first Denver API meetup. Uh, a couple weeks was it last week or two weeks ago? I don't know. The, the concept of time is still just very challenging. I think when I uh, not not uh, seeing people in person and whatnot. But uh, again, we're we're getting back there. Get we're getting back at it pretty soon. So cool. Are we? Uh, I think we're getting fairly close on the next talk here. Uh, maybe. All right. And put my anonymous mask down. Cool. Well, yes, yeah, so we got Marco coming up next with uh, how to achieve zero trust security. Oh, there, there's there's Marco. How you doing today? Doing pretty well. How are you doing? I'm doing doing awesome. And uh, where are you uh, uh, calling in from? <laughs> I'm currently calling from Hawaii, although I'm based in San Francisco. Oh, that's that, that's amazing. Well, we'll have to share some uh, some some island tips and stuff maybe uh, maybe after your talk. But uh, excited to hear uh, your talk on zero trust security. And um, anybody uh, watching on Hopin, uh, please drop any questions you have for Marco in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll get those asked at the end of the time, uh, again time permitting. But I'll, I'll let you take it away, Marco. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Palladino. I am the CTO and co-founder of Kong. And today we're going to be chatting about a topic that every organization needs to think about when building microservices and trying to build new applications on top of these new modern architectures. Our teams are fundamentally building software in a different way than, let's say, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, everything was built on top of fairly large code bases that we've been decoupling and decentralizing and distributing in order to get more velocity and to, you know, in short, get and, you know, build better products for our users and our customers, improve their user experience. Whenever we extract services from a monolith into microservices, we're going to be adding more and more connections among all the services that create our applications. In a monolith, we didn't have these many connections. Everything, sure, we had connections to a database and to other APIs, but primarily the bulk of our work was happening on top of the monolith. For example, running within the same underlying Java virtual machine or the same runtime. Obviously, when we extract our objects into separate services, all of those function calls now become network calls. And whenever we add the network in the equation, we're going to be having a whole set of new problems we have to deal with in order to be successful with these new modern microservices architectures. And our teams are fundamentally not prepared 
to deal with this new scale of connectivity because they never had to deal with it. And this new scale of connectivity has to be managed by the platform team, the architects that are provisioning the underlying infrastructure to the application teams, including on VMs and containers and Kubernetes and the cloud. Now, the cool thing about this, it is that we do have software that can help us provide this underlying connectivity to the teams, for example, service meshes. And this is also going to be a chance for us to improve our security in better ways than the monolith did. This may seem counterintuitive because we are going to be improving security, although we are still going to be decentralizing and decoupling our services. How is that possible? Well, with zero trust security, we can do that. So let's explore further how we can achieve that. The whole concept of zero trust security, it is built into this sentence. Trust is fundamentally exploitable. Trust is something that can be misled. It's something that needs to be removed from our systems. We cannot have systems based on and built on trust. We must remove the concept of trust from those applications. Therefore, zero trust. There is no trust involved. Imagine traveling in the world and going through a different country and different immigration processes. And imagine a system based on where, where no passports are required, a system based on trust. It would be only a matter of time for a malicious person to identify themselves with something that they're not, they're, they're, it's not them. A criminal may enter a new country saying that they're here for tourist reasons. And with no passport, with no identity whatsoever, immigration would have to trust them that they are who they claim they are. Trust is exploitable. And we have removed the concept of trust in other places in the world. For example, immigration with the passports. Trust is about providing an identity to every single player in the system. And likewise, we have removed the concept of trust in other areas of the world. We also must remove it from our new microservice-oriented applications. We need virtual passports for our services, something that certifies the identity of the services in such a way that it can be always verified and nobody or nothing can impersonate those services in order to pursue a potentially malicious operation. Now, in a monolithic application, this concept of zero trust was not required with the same urgency that it is required now with microservices. Look at a very simple monolithic application. Let's say that we're building a Amazon.com clone. You know, it's a marketplace. So we're going to be having user objects that identify our customers, you know, the items they can purchase, the invoices that are being generated, and so on and so forth. In a monolithic application where everything is running within the same code base, every or every monolith could communicate and consume with other objects and invoke their functions. There are ways to limit this with package level visibility and stuff like that, but they're not secure, they're not reliable. Everything is always one. PR one comment away from being insecure. And so we have all of these different functions and all of these different objects. And anybody who has access to the monolithic code base can potentially do any sorts of operation that the monolithic code base allows us to do. Everything can invoke everything else. Now, when we remove, uh, when we extract our services in the monolith into separate services, each one of them living independently, separately from each other in different processes. Obviously, you know, we get many benefits, but we're also doing something that's very important. We're removing the reliability of those function calls with the unreliability of the network. And whenever we go over a network, we now must make sure that not only the connections are secure, not only there, but they're reliable as well. Here, we have a benefit though. We can leverage existing networking software to provide new security boundaries 
in a way that the monolith didn't allow us to do. In a marketplace application that's built not in a monolithic code base, but in a microservice rented code base, we're going to be having all these different services running separately, independently from each other. And each one of them is going to be consuming each other. But what if we want to limit the ability of one service to be able to execute only certain operations or not at all to another service? How do we do that? Well, if we don't have anything in place in the underlying infrastructure, whoever is building these services also has to build these features. So every team that's creating any service for any application that wants to provide this kind of security without anything else in place, they would have to write their own code, physically writing code to identify these services, find out about an authentication authorization mechanism to use. And then once they found, they assign an identity to the services, being able to write code to determine, okay, this service can do this, but cannot do that. There is a lot of manual coding involved into securing a microservice rented architecture if we do not use something that gives us this tooling for free in the underlying infrastructure. And this is really where service mesh as a concept comes in. Service mesh, it is a network overlay that we can deploy for all of our services that allows us to provide some of these connectivity management features, including zero trust, as part of the underlying infrastructure provisioning without having to ask the teams to build all of these by themselves. This will make the teams more efficient because they do the things they should be doing, the products making the users and the customer happy, whereas the architects and the platform team can provide a modern infrastructure to them to enable them to innovate and create new products in a faster and more secure way. When building a secure system in a microservice rented architecture, but really across any service on the network, there are two things that we really have to do. First, we have to identify the services. There is no way we can say in our invoice microservice, for example, we only want requests from the user's microservice to be allowed if we don't really know who the user's microservice is and how we validate, what's the passport that identifies the originating service that's making that request in the first place. So zero trust, many people think of it as encryption. We're going to be having everything encrypted, but that's only half of the story. The other half is we must have an identity for our services. Otherwise, we cannot possibly be implementing any security rule if the identities are not valid or they are unreliable. And so we must identify the originating service, in this case, the user's service, and determine if the operation they're trying to do, for example, create a new invoice with a post invoices method is allowed or not. In order to do that, we're going to be using a system that is already quite common in our industry when it comes to the websites that we are navigating and generating. We're going to be assigning a name, um, the name of the service to a TLS certificate that we are generating for each service that's running in our systems. And we're going to be adding that service name as an additional field in the SAN of that certificate. SAN is an extension to the X509 uh, technology that we are generating, uh, utilizing to generate certificates across the board. And we're doing that for the from you know websites as well. So if we go on google.com, we can inspect the certificate and we can expect all the fields that have been added into the SAN extension. When we want to be assigning an identity to our services in a microservice rented architecture, we're going to be generating certificates by leveraging the same certificate authority for all the services that must communicate with each other. And we're going to be adding that name, the service name, the identity of the service as a field, in the, as a SAN field in the certificate that we're generating. By doing so, whenever a request is being generated by a service, it will carry along this certificate information in such a way that the receiving destination service can then parse the certificate, decrypt it, and then look at that field name to determine if the service really is who they claim they are. Using TLS certificates and using SANS to assign an identity it is the equivalent of using a passport to enter a country. It provides an identity that's verifiable 
for every service we're running in our systems. Now, of course, this is very complex. Certificates have to be issued. Certificates have to be uh, generated in such a way that the sand fields are there with the, with the right identity. Certificates have to be expired and rotated. And the more services, the more instances we have, the more distributed and decoupled we are, which is going to be more and more, the more applications our things create. And the more and more complex managing all these TLS infrastructure becomes. And that's why we're going to be using technologies like service meshes to provide all of that for us in such a way that we don't have to build it ourselves. With uh, service meshes like Huma, we can provide an underlying infrastructure that allows us to provide zero trust, but also routing, load balancing, observability, discovery, fault injection, and so on and so forth, health checks and circuit breakers to any service built in any, in any programming language. And with Cuma, Cuma is a CNCF service mesh. We can do that in an open and neutral way. Cuma is a service mesh, the first Envoy-based service mesh to ever be donated to the CNCF that's being used across the board to implement a modern service mesh that can run everywhere. Not only Kubernetes workloads, but also virtual machine-based workloads as a first-class citizen. It is a service mesh that allows us to be deployed once, and it allows us to create as many virtual service meshes as we want. It has been designed for the enterprise architect who must support every team in the organization. Therefore, we deploy this once and one only, and then we can create as many compartmentalized service meshes as we want, and we can enable zero trust in one click. It runs on VMs, it runs on Kubernetes, it runs in a distributed way, multi-zone by default. In the multi-zone, it's quite interesting. This is a deployment topology that Cuma supports, which allows us to deploy the service mesh across any data center, VPC, Kubernetes cluster, and automatically propagating and reconciliating the service mesh policies, as well as automatically enabling discovery and connectivity from one zone to another without the services having to know it. It is like running a distributed service mesh, but from an operational standpoint, it's as if we're running all of these in one cluster although it runs on different clouds, in different environments, different clusters, including hybrid VMs and containers. And zero trust can be applied in one click across the board. It's really that, that simple. There's a GUI, there's a CRD, there are CLIs, there's an HTTP API. There are policies we can apply for all sorts of things. Zero trust is only one of the many policies that are available. This is an open source project. There are charts out of the box that we can ship charts out of the box to identify the status of our service mesh across both VMs and Kubernetes, across any zone. And, and really the concept of zero trust with Cuma is built around the mutual TLS policy. So we can uh, create mesh objects, workspaces for our applications. And then for each one of these meshes, one of the things we can do is determining how we want that mutual TLS zero trust to be enabled. We can provide our own certificates or Cuma can automatically generate certificates for us, as well as Cuma will automatically rotate the certificates, no matter if we have 10 sidecar proxies running or hundreds of thousands, Cuma is a scalable service mesh that will take care of the entire certificate lifecycle for us. And um, we can then on top of this identity, provide traffic permissions or any other policy that Cuma offers to determine what source of traffic can consume what destination. And we can use any combination of attributes, including the service name, like here in this example, we are essentially allowing all traffic from any service to reach any other service. But we can also then use attributes that we specify in such a way that we can say, we only want traffic from this country to only be consuming services in, in the same country, but not another country. So with our custom attributes, we can implement simple policies like the one you're seeing now or more complex policies that are very custom. So this is uh, something that's quite unique uh, to Cuma. Cuma provides uh, lots of features that are not available in other service meshes. One of them being this fine grained tuning on how we want our traffic paths to work. And Kong Mesh uh, is the uh, enterprise version of Cuma that Kong provides. We also provide a supercharged OPA policy that allows us to implement authentication and authorization rules, higher level rules, without having to require an OPA agent sidecar. It's bundled with the same Envoy sidecar 
that the service mesh deploys. This in, in, improves the operational uh, the operations of running OPA by an order of magnitude, because with any other service mesh, we would have to run an additional sidecar in addition to Envoy, and then manage the operations of all of that, not with Kong mesh. With Kong mesh, that uh, OPA agent is being bundled with the same sidecar that runs Envoy. And I want to show you a very simple demo. This is a demo that runs uh, across multiple Kubernetes clusters on GKE, as well it runs on virtual machines on EC2. So what you're looking at right now, it is a uh, demo of Kong Mesh, and Kong Mesh is built on top of Kuma. So with Kuma, it would work the same way. That runs across multiple clouds, VMs on AWS, and multiple Kubernetes clusters on GKE. So this is a multi-cloud, multi-region, hybrid containers and VMs demonstration of this technology. And uh, I'm going to be connecting to the global control plane which is the control plane that holds the source of truth of all the policies that will be automatically propagated to the zone control planes once per each zone that we're deploying. So we have a zone in this cluster, a zone in this cluster, and a zone on EC2. So I'm going to be um, port forwarding um, my service mesh control plane in such a way that we can access the data that's available there. So if I consume the API, obviously there is an HTTP API that can be integrated. Uh, but there is a GUI, like I said, and the GUI is built on top of the same underlying HTTP API I just showed you. So anything that the GUI can do, anything that the GUI is showing you can also be done in an automated way via the API. So let me refresh here. Let me forward again. And this is going to be very simple. I'm going to be showing you how to enable Zero Trust across this complex infrastructure in one click. So as I as my connection pulls up the GUI, there we go, very slowly, because my connection is quite bad right now. We're going to be seeing the dashboard that the system is providing us. And as I do that, we're going to be looking at the policies that Qma offers, one of them being mutual TLS. And with mutual TLS, we can um, apply mutual TLS on top of virtual machines. We can apply it on top of Kubernetes. And for Kubernetes, we're going to be having an example that we're going to be applying with kubectl, whereas for Universal, uh, which is virtual machines, for example, we're going to be using our kubectl CLI. So effectively, this is a first-class support for both. Let me see why this is not working. Um, for both, for both uh, Kubernetes and virtual machines. The demo application is quite simple. It's a demo app that allows us to consume and increment a counter on Redis. So if I go in my demo application and I increment my counters, we're seeing that depending on what Redis instance we're loading, uh, we're going to be hitting different zones. Uh, I really wanted this GUI to work, uh, but for some reason, it is not working. I'll, let me try with uh, incognito. But I suspected this is because I'm currently in a hotel room, so the connection is not very working very well. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, without mutual TLS enabled, the traffic will not go to our Kubernetes clusters. But if we do enable mutual TLS in one click by updating our default mesh with the built-in mutual TLS, and we provide the uh, underlying kubectl command to do that and apply it, in our, I see timeouts occurred. It's my internet connection in the hotel, unfortunately. Uh, but we can see that if we do that with mutual TLS enabled automatically, the global control plane will propagate our resource across every remote zone. And as soon as that's happening, we're going to be generating a certificate authority, provisioning the certificates for each zone and enabling cross zone communication that's secure, that has an identity that's encrypted across any zone, including VMs and Kubernetes. So I'm going to be stopping here because we're running out of time. Uh, but if you can try it yourself. I'm pretty sure the GUI will work in your case. And you can see that mutual TLS is disabled through the GUI and then gets enabled through the GUI again. Yeah, so I have a connectivity problem, unfortunately. Uh, well, thank you so much. And if there are any questions, this is the time to ask them.
Yeah, well, thank you so much, Marco. Uh, and I have to say, like, hotel connectivity, internet issues, that's like music to my ears, man. That's like we're getting back to normal, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, uh, so uh, we'll uh, see if any more questions are coming in uh, via hop in. If anybody has questions for Marco, please drop those in uh, right now. I have to say, though, I was surprised that that none of your talk had to do with one of my college girlfriends, who I think was an expert on all things zero trust, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Tony. <laughs> 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 uh, thank you so much. Well, it was a it was a painful couple of months, but well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll that's a story I'll share maybe over over beers next time we're, we're hanging out in a in a hotel with 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 bad internet in the future at some point, right? <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, Zoom Trust is something that you know for anybody. I don't know if there's any question coming in, but uh, everything that I've done can also be replicated uh, on Cuma.io. So if anything wants to implement whatever I was trying to demonstrate. They can do that in the comfort of their own mini cube cluster uh, or virtual machine uh, very easily. Oh, that's awesome! Well, that definitely looks like it's super easy to get started. Uh, is there a uh, like a link that you could maybe drop in uh, the chat or something that might be a, an easy way if anybody wants to to dig in and and uh, play around with with the tech themselves? Yeah, it's very simple. It's Kuma.io. K U M A dot IO. So Kuma.io.com, there is getting started and there is the policies and everybody can get up and running with it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, uh, I uh, do have some news to share. Uh, unfortunately, our next speaker uh, is uh, unable to make it. So uh, Marco, if it's okay, if you could stick around, maybe we could do a little bit of a, a kind of fireside chat in a few minutes. Uh, is, is that okay? Do you have time to hang out for, for a little bit? Sounds good. Yeah, I can do that. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Well, uh, well, awesome. Uh, I'll uh, actually take a few minutes because uh, I'd like to mention two initiatives uh, that API Days is focused on uh, in, uh, while we try to fill up a little bit of time here with this unexpected uh, uh, schedule uh, change. Um, one uh, thing that API Days uh, supports, and I encourage everybody uh, attending to, to dig up more information and, and get involved, but uh, is a Women in APIs initiative. Uh, so uh, all of the, uh, the partners, the organizers of API Days, uh, very much focused to support diversity and inclusivity. Uh, you can hit apidays.global and visit the, uh, the website uh, there and uh, get more information on how we can uh, support more uh, equality in the API space. It's something that I think we all need to uh, to focus on, uh, uh, definitely for sure. And uh, the other initiative that I uh, think is awesome that API Days is is working on is the Sustainable D Digital Challenge in partnership with GreenNet.io. Uh, you know, it's been uh, baking in the Pacific Northwest and in Canada. I don't know if any uh, viewers are in uh, the land of Canada. But um, you know, sustainability is something that I think is important in all of us, and uh, great to see uh, you know community organizers like API Days uh, also supporting that uh, initiative uh, as well. Uh, so again, for those of you just joining, uh, my name is Tony Blank, and I'm a director of startup programs at Agora. Agora is a real-time API uh, provider. Um, uh, we actually have uh, we went public on the stock exchange. We're we're API on the stock exchange, which is crazy. Isn't that, isn't that nuts? Uh, pretty crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, like, we've all been locked inside here in, in a pandemic, uh, me, my pets included. And one of the things that, uh, you know, thinking about stocks, right? You know, like that, that my dog actually picked up uh, uh, stock brokering as a hobby, which I think is pretty crazy. So here's, uh, there's Indy, and uh, Indy has a couple of uh, stock picks. What was, if you're interested in, 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 in seeing Indy stock picks, uh, her picks of the day uh, are honestly a lot of like, like dog food uh, companies, like Chewy, uh, Church and Dwight, uh, and Colgate, both are big conglomerates, but pretty, pretty good day, pretty good day in the pet stocks. Um, Alonco Animal Health is actually Indy's uh, pick of the month. Uh, they do pet vaccines. And uh, and yeah, uh, Indy likes this stock because bats are delicious. 
Uh, she loves she loves to eat bats, which is, you know, it's not really the most safe uh, safest of uh, activities uh, these day, these days. But uh, but yeah. So anyway, uh, Marco, uh, you're still with us here. We've got uh, about 20 minutes or so until the next talk. So. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the hop in chat. So if anybody has a question for Marco, uh, please drop uh, stuff in there. Um, but if uh, Marco, if you could just tell me a little bit about your history, uh, where are you from, and and uh, you know how'd you get kind of interested? I mean, in uh, in kind of the API space. I mean, certainly Kong's a huge uh, huge player and everything. Well, Kong comes from another company that was originally started by me and Augusto. I come from Italy, I'm Italian, and uh, approximately 12 years ago, I moved to the US with the idea of creating a marketplace for APIs. We thought that back then, you know, it was clear that the APIs were going to be ruling the world. So really what you're seeing with Kong, it is the culmination of 10 or 15 years of work around the APIs. And back in 2015, we were running the API marketplace with 350,000 developers consuming and publishing APIs. And we needed something for ourselves that was able to power all of these transactions, trillions of transactions we were, we were generating. And there was nothing out there. Every API gateway there was monolithic. Every API gateway there was uh, hard to scale. It was built in the SOAP SOA world in the mid 2000s, right? And so we needed something for ourselves and we built it. And that was Kong, and then we open sourced it. And turns out what we built for ourselves really was what everybody else needed as they were going through this microservices transition. You know, Mashape did that microservices transition back in 2013. So it was even prior to Docker and Kubernetes. And we built this for that world and, and whatever we built for ourselves ended up being what everybody else needed. And so we open sourced Kong. It was so successful that we decided to rename the company from Mashape to Kong and run the connectivity company instead. And, and the reason why it's called Kong, it is because Mesh Ape used to have this ape gorilla in the logo. And Tony, what's the most, what's the biggest ape in the world? King Kong. <laughs> and so we called the, the new open source right. project Kong. <laughs> so. Right on. I'll, uh, I'm going to switch my my uh, video over to this. I, I'm almost positive that I have one of my little old Happy hours of API days past is is a picture of a beer with a mash shape sticker on it. I think. <laughs> oh, you got that? You got the vintage one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. So I'll, I'll I can keep these playing up. We can kind of keep keep an eye on these while uh, while we're hanging. Um, but yeah, that's 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 awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we are a group of people that are obsessed. With, with connectivity and obsessed by the impact that this is going to be creating in the world. APIs really are a new industrial revolution. You know, back, back in the days, we you know, were building cars by assembling together pre-made components, and then that's how the assembly line was born. And we think of APIs as being the assembly line of software. And microservices and all that's happening in the world, it's incredibly exciting because it's going to be allowing us to build better products for the world really, and being able to create new experiences for humanity in a way that was not imaginable with old monolithic applications. So I'm incredibly proud to say we are working with some great customers and, and great users in the open source community to enable these use cases, which at the end of the day allows them to execute on their vision. And their vision is changing the world, each one in their industry, and in the financial industry, the healthcare industry, the technology industry. And um, I'm very humbled and, and proud that you know they're relying on Kong to power these new these new products. And so, really, um, a group of obsessed people that have believed in APIs for 15 years, uh, and uh, and Kong and Kong and Kuma and everything else that we're doing really is the result of that obsession. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. I mean, and, and I, I really think that you know what we're seeing now, you know, with the uh, kind of the realization of all the stuff that we were talking about back in the days when we were drinking beers with mash shape stickers, where you know now we see you know the API uh, economy and landscape is uh, you know it has that that level of ubiquitousness, uh, so so that, that we can see this data being portable, so people can can build these apps. In uh, in easy, scalable, you know, rapid ways to fit the needs that we have. At the end of the day, we're just connecting humans 
<laughs> to each other, you know, and and uh, and and so that's uh, it's awesome that that Kong's uh, powering a lot of that stuff. Yeah, no, yeah, it's very exciting, and and uh, you know, with with more connectivity, uh, also came new challenges, and and so it, it is very interesting to work with these new use cases that every organization in the world is applying. And, and, you know, moving to microservices can be challenging, but also can give lots of leverage. And organizations that are doing this transition are getting, and they're doing it right, with the right technology partners, are way more successful in the short and long term than the, those who don't. Because it truly really allows us to create software in a faster way, to target new markets in a faster way, to enter those new markets, to being able to create these new experiences, not from scratch all the time, but by leveraging what we have already built, either new applications we've built or legacy applications and integrate them as part of that strategy. And, you know, connectivity uh, really is what makes this world turn around when it comes to all the digital experiences we're creating. And, and so it is a super exciting field, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Um, well, I, you know, I have to say, as as running uh, startup programs uh, for for Agora, uh, you know, in the pandemic, I've I've certainly seen a big shift in in how uh, companies operate, and and uh, I was wondering, have you seen uh, any kind of a shift in how people are are kind of turning to APIs, or turning to Kong and and the services, any kind of different kind of usage in a pandemic, or, or you know, it's just very interesting kind of times. Have you seen any kind of changes lately? Well, if anything, the pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation across all these industries and all these, uh, you know, or organizations. It is clear that if we are not digital and we don't do that right, we're going to be displaced by the competitors that do implement digital the right way. Uh, if anything, it has accelerated some of these uh, topics. And, and with that, really, the organization is rethinking how they're not only building the software and deploying it, but how they're doing everything around connectivity and security and and even with the latest uh high profile you know security breaches we've been experiencing here in the us it, it is a clear that things like zero trust and, and proper encryption in place and proper identity in place it is something that is required it's not a nice to have it's not a feature it's the baseline of every modern infrastructure as a matter of fact the white house has just mandated zero trust for every federal customer and federal agency in order to prevent what has happened with with the pipeline you know that's the most recent one to prevent that from happening again in other areas so zero trust particularly it's a super hot topic right now but microservices are rethinking how we think of performance performance is a must have when the monolith was down the application was down but in microservices when the services are slow the application is down slow is the new down so how do we build microservices that are fast that are performant and that are never down that are reliable that can be automatically switching traffic from one cloud to another if there are problems and all of that infrastructure it is things that you know kong really provides our bread and butter so awesome awesome well that that definitely makes no sense and you, you mentioned pipeline and you're, you're in hawaii right so are are you a surfer did you surf Oh yeah, well. So I I try to, but I'm horrible at it. Uh, I had a kid a couple of years ago, and so you know I've been I've been uh, extremely focused for on gateways and service meshes, and a new kid for a couple of years. So I had to take my first week off in a couple of years, and I decided to come here. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I uh, well, congratulations on prioritizing taking a week off. I think that that I'm definitely envious uh, of you, uh, and thank you so much for sticking around a bit longer after the talk and and chatting a little bit more. Uh, I really, really uh, enjoyed the time, and I'm going to let you get back to the island life. And uh, if, if you need any drinking buddies in Hawaii, uh, hit me up. I, I got some friends that are thirsty, so just uh, you, you can't, let you, me can't know. you can't, you can't. You can't see it, but I have my stream trunks down here, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> oh, so that, that's awesome. That, that's, that sounds kind of like me on every business call in a pandemic, except it was no swim trunks. It was no pants. It was just, you know, I call that the business mullet, right? When when, when you're all uh, Zoom appropriate from the waist up and then you're, you know, kind of party time, uh, you know. Anyway, all right. I, a, I, think, I think I've said enough. That's the Bermuda dress attire. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, thank you again so, so much, Marco. Uh, you you enjoy the rest of your holiday, and uh, and and again, thank you so much for sharing about Kong and uh, and and uh, no no trust security. All right, cool.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Excellent.